Your homework is to memorize this and write it 15 times. Welcome to the coolest, hippest half hour of fun on TV. This is Brain Stew with Jennifer Pulley. Ever seen a real brain? This week, Brain Stew explores the mysteries of the human brain and finds out how electricity makes our brain work. Plus, we learn how doctors can take a picture of our brain and see what's going on using a CAT scan machine. All that and much more to keep your brain stewing on this week's show. Put down the remote and prepare to give your brain a workout. Oh yeah, that looks familiar. Hey you guys, welcome to Brain Stew. My name is Jennifer Pulley. Have you ever wondered why we call the show Brain Stew? I think the show is called Brain Stew because basically you're stewing up your brain to be smart, to think of all these answers for different kinds of questions. It gets your brain to just think. Your brain's filled with so many different things, it's like a stew. Oh, your brains are always working, aren't they? The show is like a huge pot of stew that feeds your brain things you ought to know, like math, and science, and history, and English. It's all in that stew. Anyway, since I'm always talking about your brain, I figured, hey, why not do a show on the brain? I mean, how much do you really know about the space between your ears? Humans, uh, that's like you and I. We have the largest brain for our body size in the animal world. For years, the brain has been called the supercomputer. But get this, our brain right here is more complicated than any computer on Earth. Even doctors don't know exactly how our entire brain works, but they are discovering more and more about it every day. Here's what we do know. Our brain is part of our central nervous system. Now, with the help of the spinal cord, the brain communicates with the rest of the body. The brain itself controls things like movement, breathing, sleeping, watching TV, and even our heartbeat. The brain also controls all our emotions, like love, hate, get away, fear, anger, excitement, sadness. We also know our brain has to be stimulated, or else it will suffer. Studies have shown that kids who are very inactive or have little or no human contact develop abnormal brains. Check out this PET scan of a normal brain and an abnormal brain. This is the brain of an orphan who was neglected during infancy. Look at the difference. Very active right here in the front part of the brain and not very active at all over there. Gotta stimulate the brain. Imagine sitting in a white room with nothing in it, no music. No sound, no people, no nothing for 12 hours. You go crazy, and your brain, it would suffer. Remember, if you don't use it, you lose it. But here's where our brain is unique. Young children can recover from severe brain injury and lost nerve cells. Of course, your brain is always learning. Well, that is if you stimulate it. Another really cool thing that that big brain of yours does is that it receives and decodes the millions of signals that are sent to it from all parts of your body. Wait, wait, let me give you a simple example. You got a pan, right? It's hot. Touch the hot pan. Nerves in your finger send a pain message to your brain. Your brain tells you the pan is hot and you pull your finger away quickly. So, how does our brain work and allow us to do all these things? Believe it or not, our brain works because of electricity and chemical changes. What? Electricity and chemicals make our brain work? Oh, uh, that's what I'm saying. Now, since I'm only the host of Brain Stew and not a brain expert, we're here at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. We're going to talk to a few friends of mine who are going to help us better understand the universe between our ears. How big is our brain? About three pounds if you're a grown-up and about one pound if you're a baby. Wow. Do you want to come over and uh, hold one? I would love to hold a brain. I definitely want you to hold that brain because there's nothing like holding the human brain in between your hands. Now, where did this um, brain come from? These come from people who donate their bodies to uh, medical schools. That is so cool. 
So there it is, right yeah, in there. Go just ahead go ahead and, and just, just lift it up. Grab it. It's a miracle. It is. It's not very heavy. No, three pounds of uh, stuff is not a whole lot of stuff, but it's probably the most complicated thing in the universe and uh, probably the most amazing thing in the universe. We don't understand hardly anything about the brain if you think about it. This is a, a universe that remains to be explored, and we need lots more kids to uh, become neuroscientists who are going to be neuro explorers. What is a neurobiologist? We're people who do research on the nervous system. The nervous system is the brain. It's the spinal cord. Here is the spinal cord right here coming out of the brain. Uh -huh. It goes down your spinal cord. But we're kind of like neuro explorers is what we are. Yeah. We're exploring this unknown universe here that uh, we're just beginning to understand in a, in a very limited way. What are the main parts of the human brain? The, the main part of the human brain, let's, let's have you hold this. The main part of the human brain is this cortex that surrounds the top of it. There's no creature on Earth that has a more sophisticated or well-developed cortex. The second most well-developed uh, creature on Earth as far as cortex is concerned is probably the dolphin. And if you could see a dolphin brain, oh, it's really a remarkable thing. So the next time you look at a dolphin, wonder what's going on between the ears of a dolphin. It's mm -hmm. pretty cool. It's this front part of the cortex that really makes us a whole lot different from the animals. This is the frontal lobe, and uh, the frontal lobe is uh, very much involved with judgment and uh, uh, learning and a variety of other functions. Uh, all of the brain is made out of cells that are called neurons, and I think we'll talk later about what a neuron is. But yeah. the building block of all of the brain is the neuron, but the ultimate achievement of the human brain is this cortex here, which just is a wonderful thing and allows us to experience all the great uh, experiences we have. Allows us to think, allows us to laugh, allows us to be sad, allows us to play games, uh, allows us to create things. It's just a remarkable achievement. What does a brain feel like? I like to tell children that the consistency of the brain uh, in between our ears is about oatmeal. So get a bowl of oatmeal and put your hands in the oatmeal, and uh, <laughs> that's about what uh, this most miraculous of organs feels like. So, so I mean, so this is firm. Right? I'm feeling it. It's kind yeah, of firm right now. So this is not really how our brain is inside of our head. Right. It's more like oatmeal. It's very soft, yes. very fragile. Let me let me tell you where your hand is. What you're holding in your hand in the back of the brain here is what we see with. You know, a lot of people think we see with our eyes. We don't see with our eyes. We see with uh, our cortex. And so you don't see with your eyes, you see with your cortex. You don't hear and with your ears. the back of your cortex. Yeah, you see with the back of your brain. Mm. Let me show you this area right here, hanging down yeah, from the cortex. Yeah, it's kind of weird looking. Yeah, that's, some people call that the little brain. Uh, that's the cerebellum. Cerebellum plays an important role in motor coordination. The American <laughs> Gymnastics Association has recognized that the sooner we start exercising children, the more well-developed these uh, cerebellum will become. So that's just that's both just of these? But one on each side. You have two of everything. Or one cerebellum on one side, one on the other side. Now, uh, in between here, this is the brain stem. This keeps us alive. This is what keeps us alive. Now, what you're holding here is probably a little bit of the spinal cord, the top of the spinal cord, which comes up the, uh, the back. Spinal cord enters a big window in the skull. This is the skull here. Uh, and uh, the front of the skull and the back of the skull. And this is uh, the vault that protects this miraculous thing called the, uh, the brain. In fact, we call it the cranial vault. And what happens is the spinal cord comes up this big window here. It's a big window. And this is where the, uh, the spinal cord comes up. So like that could come, I mean, this skull's a little too small, but that brain could fit in there yes. and the little stem would go like and then the, the bottom. then the spinal cord would be going out down there. <laughs> this is the uh, uh, hypothalamus and thalamus down here. These are interesting areas. And everything we sense, except for smell, but all the stuff we hear and see and feel goes through the thalamus before it gets up on top of the cerebral cortex. So it's a, an important relay station. Okay, so I've got this straight here. We've got the cerebral cortex. Right. Okay. We've got the thalamus. Right. And the brainstem. And the brainstem. Keeps right you here. alive with the okay. spinal cord on the bottom. Okay. And the cerebellum. All right. Now, what I want to show you is the thumb of the boxing glove because there's some neat thing inside the thumb of the boxing glove. If you could hold that carefully, this is a dissected brain that uh, my colleague Dr. Scott uh, dissected. This is the brain looking towards you now. Okay. And here is the thumb of the boxing glove right there. Yes. We're going to go inside the thumb of the boxing glove and let's see what's in there. If you go inside the thumb of the boxing glove, you'll see the structure. Hold it down if you could. You see this little structure right here. It looks kind of funny. It looks like a horn. It's, some people call it a horn. They call it almond's horn. Mm. But that funny looking structure is the hippocampus. Let's take this apart. And now we're going to look at this hippocampus. If you could hold it, yeah. it's really a neat thing. 
The hippocampus plays a role in memory, short-term memory. So, really? Yeah, it's very tiny. But without this hippocampus, you can't learn any new information. If you get that damaged, you can't learn any new information. And it turns out the hippocampus can be damaged very easily by not enough oxygen if you nearly drown and by lots of other kinds of problems. And so the hippocampus is something we need to take care of. So the more the, you exercise your body and the more you exercise your brain, the more the hippocampus will uh, do what it's supposed to do and the longer the cells will live. So that's wow. a pretty neat thing. I think about the hippocampus. That's really cool. Now let me tell you one other thing in the thumb of the boxing glove. This area right here in front of the hippocampus is called the amygdala. And most of our emotions are very much related to what happens in the amygdala. So if a dog comes at you and you're afraid, that's your amygdala. How do you if spell a, amygdala? A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A. -A -A. I believe it means nut, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I, believe, I think it means nut. But this is very important for emotion. And so if a dog comes at you and you love dogs and you feel happy, it's also very importantly related to the amygdala. Wait, hold on a second. Don't we have two brains, a left and a right? We do have two brains. Here is the whole brain. And we have a brain on the right and we have a brain on the left, separated by this space. Let's cut down the middle of the space and see again what the midpoint looks like. Mm -hmm. Here we are. All right. And one of the ways the right brain and the left brain talk to each other is through this fiber system here called the corpus callosum. Now the other brain looks exactly like this. Pretty much exactly the same except for the fact that it's on the other side. Yeah. But the functions are different because we know the left brain seems to play an important role in the mathematical abilities and we know for example the right brain tends to play a, a role in important emotional activities and creative activities. But we don't operate with just a right brain or a left brain because we have this connection and sure. the two talk to one another. And I can tell you we know that from imaging studies and we know that from the thickness of this that the female brain is a superior brain based on, uh, on that fact. Mm -hmm. But maybe some people knew that all along. <laughs> oh, wow. What can I do to make my brain smarter? Physical exercise is a good way to help our brain because what physical exercise will do is increase blood flow to the brain and as you increase blood flow to the brain, you increase oxygen delivery and nutritional support for the brain and that's all good stuff. Besides physically exercising the brain, we need to mentally exercise the brain and that's what people don't understand or forget about because this is something that's like a muscle and just like the quadriceps are the biggest muscle in the body and if you don't use it, you lose it, yeah. we know that the brain is uh, also something that needs to be exercised because if you don't use the brain, you lose it in a very fundamental way. So yeah. how could we exercise the brain? Things like Mozart, a wonderful way to exercise the brain. It lights up very complicated areas of the brain, like complicated math problems light up some of the same areas that Mozart lights up. We also could think about chess. I think there should be a chess club in every school where kids learn to think with chess and because chess lights up some of the same brains that Mozart, some same, same parts of the brain that Mozart lights up. What about reading? Oh, reading is a wonderful thing, but you don't have to just read what a teacher gives you. You could read stuff on your own. You could read on weekends. You could read in the summertime. And better yet, you could make your own material. You could create a story. You could write a story and, and, and read the story. That brain power. Yeah, because, boy, creative uh, stuff really uses a whole ton of, uh, of brain stuff. A man by the name of Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Say, do you use your brain to its capacity? When brain stew returns, we'll strengthen our brain cells. And we'll find out what happens to our brain if it gets injured. Hey, can you touch that remote? How our brain works, what are these neurons, all that good stuff. Well, I think maybe Dr. Scott would be the best person to answer that. How about if you go to ask him? That sounds good. We'll go talk to Dr. Scott. Thank you, Dr. Scott. What is a neuron? A neuron, in its juvenile form, is a very smooth appearing cell. That's a, that's a neuron and right this, there? These are two neurons side by side on the surface of the brain. Uh, this is the cell body and emanating from it are a number of processes which are called dendrites and a much longer, larger process called an axon. This neuron will communicate with other neurons by sending out a bioelectric signal all along its axon, which will then be intercepted by the dendrites of other neurons. 
dendrites are a mechanism for other neurons uh, at long distances away from this particular neuron to pick up the signal and this then forms an integrated pathway which is important for memory, uh, which is important for movement, which is important for a wide variety of things that the brain orchestrates. How does our brain work? The neurons themselves fire at, like an electrical impulse? It's a bioelectric impulse and it's called an action potential. What, so you don't believe neurons fire? You want to see them and hear them? How are we going to see this? Well, what we can do is we can make a miniature microphone and we make it out of a tiny piece of glass. It's very small and we, what we do is we heat it and pull it so that at the very tip, 200 of these could fit in the diameter of a human hair. And we put this tiny microphone into the nervous system, into the brain or the spinal cord, and of an animal. Of an animal. Okay. And this can pick up the electrical activity of the neurons that are firing there. Because the, it acts as a microphone, it's like any other microphone, it'll pick up the electrical signal and we send it through an amplifier, this device here, which en enables us to take that very tiny sound and magnify it to the point where we can hear it on the audio monitor and see it on the oscilloscope. If you consider for a moment that you have billions of neurons. I mean, they're firing all the time. All the time, even when you sleep. They're always firing. They're always firing. All of this is occurring in this three, three and a half pounds of stuff between your ears. So for me to talk to you, all my neurons have to be firing at different times for me to use my hand motion for me to do all of this stuff. Well, doing everything you're doing right now, you're certainly using a whole lot of neurons. That's really cool. How does drug abuse affect our brain? Drug abuse rewires the brain. Let's get this brain here, let you hold it, and we'll show you what parts of the brain are rewired by drugs. Now, what is the, the drug that is most de deadly? Which drug kills more Americans? I know. What is it? Tobacco. Great, great. A lot of people think it's heroin or cocaine. It's not. The most deadly drug is tobacco. You keep saying rewiring. I mean, if, uh, drugs are messing with the neurons? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah they're actually changing the connectivity that's there and the firing patterns that are like there. Like Dr. Scott was talking about. Yes, yes, exactly. just like that. Yeah. Uh, those neurons are, are uh, interacting in a much different way than is otherwise the case. And they should. And then, right. And <laughs> until that person is treated, that person's not going to be able to just say no. As a result, when a person becomes chemically addicted, they need to be treated, and we need to do more research to find more effective treatments. Now that we kind of know how our brain works, let's find out what happens if our brain gets injured. This is Dr. Wyrider. Okay, I've got a basic question here. We, we've seen what our brain looks like, and we know it's protected by our skull. How do doctors look at our brain if it's inside our skull? We have, we have special x-rays. What? Special, because the common x-ray is something called a CAT scan. Cat like a meow? Cat like a meow, but it doesn't mean meow. Okay. What it means is a computer, axial, like slices out of a loaf of bread, tomogram. C-A-T. C-A-T. Okay. That's what it is. It's just a, just a short form. We call it a CAT scan. Okay. It's a nice x-ray, um, like a big washing machine, like a big donut that you slide into, and the machine revolves around you, takes the pictures, and we see it on a fancy TV screen. And you're awake during this? Uh, you're awake from that. Wow. That's right. You lay there and you don't do much pain. So it's kind of like an x-ray of like a bone, if we have a broken bone, but you guys are actually getting Except it's a much bigger machine. Okay, much bigger machine. Okay. All right. What, what do these pictures look like, these cat scan pictures? Well, we've got a couple you can take a look at over here. Oh, yeah. You're going to have to explain like. what these mean. Okay. Here. Well, see, <laughs> these are all pictures of someone's skull and brain. Okay. And now you have to realize what you've done. You go and you buy a loaf of bread and you look at the whole loaf. But what we've done is we've taken a whole bunch of slices and we've thrown them on, uh, on the table. Okay. Okay. And these slices are, oh, about a quarter of an inch thick. Okay. And we're starting way down low, like you see here's someone's eyes, mm -hmm. and you're coming from the bottom of your head, moving up. Okay. And you're looking, this is someone's brain. Wow. That's inside their head, and you can see what's going on. And this brain looks perfectly normal. And this is obviously getting to the top That's of the right. brain, the this, very top. This is very, all the way up top. Okay, now when you're, so you're talking, it's like, I mean, if we were to take our head and kind of like slice like that, is that what you mean, slices? Uh, not quite like that, more of a little, little bit of an angle, but just taking slices all the way up the top. That's so right. how do you know that this brain's normal? I mean, I know you've been looking at these well, CAT scans. Well, we know, you saw some of the brain uh, anatomy, and as this technology has developed over the last 25 years, we know that's a normal brain. Okay, so what does an admirable brain look like? 
Over here, we have someone who was in a crash and banged their head. Now, okay. if you look at the normal, you can see the difference between the gray matter and the white matter. Yes. And everything looks kind of the same color. Okay, now if you look at what we see here, you've got this white stuff. You've obviously got the white bone. This is skull. Of the skull, which you saw here. Yep. But you've got all this other white stuff all through the brain here. What is that? Well, that's blood. That's Someone has taken a strong enough hit to the head that they've jostled around and they've got bleeding inside the head and she's got a blood clot between the skull and the brain. Here you see this white splotch of blood and you get the impression that things are being pushed across the midline there. If I punch you in the shoulder, your shoulder gets all black and blue and hurts. And it swells. Well, your soft tissue of your arm, the skin and muscle, let, lets it swell and it bothers you, but it gets better. Yeah. The skull is a rigid box. The only place the brain can swell is it gets pushed down to the spinal cord. Now, we call that herniation of the brain stem. The brain stem is where you control your breathing, your heart rate, your blood pressure, the things you don't even think about. Sure. When you herniate that, you kill it. That's when someone dies. So you look at that and you realize that's an issue that we need to deal with fairly quickly. You need an operation to get that blood clot out of there. How do you operate on the brain? Well, we have the neurosurgeons operate on the brain. Okay. And what the neurosurgeon has to do is take this patient to the operating room, do a kind of operation where they open the skull, take the clot out, and try and stop the bleeding. Um, I don't know if this would be considered a brain injury. When I was little, I slipped on a rock and fell and hit my head, and the doctor said I had a concussion. What's that? Concussion means you got hit in the head hard enough you don't really remember what happened. Very, very common. Most people recover from it just fine. This is a cat scan? This is a cat. This is it. The patient lays on this. All right. The x-ray machine is built into the big donut, if you will, wow. inside there. And this table moves so it can slide you in and out. And it takes the x-ray. And we look at it out there. Oh, cool. Can I get on it? Not bad. All right. I bet I have a really normal brain. It's probably really huge, too. All right, now, after the CAT scan, when I was on the bed in there and I went in and, you know, pretended to have a CAT scan done, where does, where do the images go from there? Images they goes to Richard's computer here. Okay. Richard's computer reconstructs the image, and we get a chance to look at it. Wow. And you can look at all the images here? Yeah, Richard went to roll through some of that. How many images are we talking per head? About 18 images per head. There's CAT scan, wow. You know, we see, Richard, why don't you tell us what we're looking at there? Well, we're in the middle portion of the brain. This black area that you see here is called the ventricles. And this patient, unfortunately, has a hemorrhage right in the middle of the brain. This white tissue here is blood that has uh, uh, leaked out into the tissue of the brain. What can I do to protect my brain from injury? Helmets. Really? That's that simple? It's that simple. Bicycle helmets when they bicycle, when they skateboard, when they rollerblade. Bicycle helmets are the biggest, most important thing that they can do. I know, I know. You've heard that helmet rap from doctors, from, from me, from your teachers, from your parents. But here's the difference. Today, you actually saw what can happen if you don't choose to wear your brain bucket. Now, you've only got one brain. Make sure you protect it, because you're never too old to wear your helmet, whether you're biking or skateboarding or, or rollerblading. Always wear your helmet. Don't go away. Back in a minute with this week's experiment. sensitive are you? Let's try out this week's experiment and find out. Here's what you need. 
two sharp pencils, some tape, and a helper. Here's the procedure. Step one, tape your pencils together so that the points are even. Ask your helper to look away and then gently touch his or her forearm. So Jennifer, how many points do you feel? I feel one point. Try this experiment again, but this time touch your helper's finger. How many points do you feel this time, Jennifer? Two. <laughs> As you can see, Jennifer felt two points on her finger, but only one point on her forearm. Why is this? Let me tell you. The nerve endings in the arm and other parts of the body are too few in number to let your brain decode the two separate points from the pencils. However, the extra number of nerve endings in the finger and thumb allow your brain to make more accurate identifications. The areas with more nerve endings experience pain more easily than other body parts. What can I do to make my brain cells grow? Oh, you can do tons. Work out your brain by getting involved in intellectually challenging areas that are new to you, and your dendrites will grow. Uh, try a musical instrument. Do some puzzles and read, read, read. Your brain is like a muscle, and if you don't use it, you're gonna lose it. Why do you think I always tell you to keep your big brain stewing every week? I'll see you and that universe between your ears next week. We're gonna talk to a few of my friends who are gonna, who are gonna Jennifer Pulley, in care of brain stew. P.O. Box, North of Virginia. Oh. <laughs> a man by the name of <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's get this. Our brain is much more complicated.